Welcome back, Myrmidons. I am Janelle Rhiannon, your podcast host and author of the Trojan War series, The Homeric Chronicles. I am happy you're continuing this journey with me as I explore, share, and write about the Trojan War and related Greek myths. I am stoked to be delivering the long-awaited deep dive into some of our favorite and maybe some lesser-known male characters of the Trojan War era. But have no fear, I am still not finished with the Wonder Women of Greek Myth episodes. It's just that this one on Achilles has been burning a hole in my brain. If you're enjoying my podcasts, by all means, like and subscribe on your favorite platform. I have some exciting news at the end, so stay tuned for that. I'd also like to give a shout out to two of my biggest supporters over the years, David D. and Chris D., my own double D's, just like HBO Game of Thrones. Gentlemen, this episode is dedicated to you. Let's get to it, shall we? You might think that writing about Achilles as a character in a mythological retelling would be relatively easy. His famous deeds and ending are well known, but writing about Achilles is challenging as he's one of the most complicated characters of the Homeric Chronicles. He's probably the most famous Trojan War character with Homer devoting an entire song or book to him that we call the Iliad. To get a good grasp on Achilles' character, to really see him in all his complexity, you have to explore four aspects his early life and training, his life as a commander and combat veteran in the Bronze Age, his personal relationships with his closest associates, and his standing among the Myrmidons and Agamemnon's army. For the time frame of Achilles' narrative, listen to the Greek mythology retold episodes 1 through 3, as Achilles is a pivotal character of the Trojan War chronology that I've been working on over the years. What I've discovered is that Achilles is so much more than the sum of his parts and much more than the well-known bits of his story. We're all familiar with his rage at Agamemnon, his withdrawal from war over Briseis, his grief over Patrocles' death, his brutal treatment of Hector's body, and his death at the hand of Paris with an arrow, quote, to his heel. But what is his motivation from Aulis onward after Agamemnon calls him to war? And what did he do during the nine years of silence before the Iliad begins? What relationships are being built in the Homeric void? This is the Achilles that I'm reaching for. From the ancient to the modern world, Achilles has been portrayed in many ways. Culture by culture, era by era, He is adapted to fit the audience, a point made by Dr. Celsiana Warwick's paper, Post-Homeric Representations of Achilles and Patrocles in Classical Greek Literature. The baseline for Achilles' character is generally Homer's Iliad. This is, by and large, the accepted canon for Achilles and the Trojan War narrative as we know it in modern storytelling. Dr. Casey Dewey Hackney writes about how Homer was just one singer of the Trojan War stories who traveled throughout the Greek world, and that there were actually many singers and many songs that were threaded into the larger fabric that we now call the Trojan War. Homer's work, credited at about 750 BC, has survived intact, where others' works have come to us in fragments. The most well-known of those is probably Hesiod, a poet of the 8th century BC and a contemporary of Homer. There followed classical Greek plays and medieval and Renaissance tales built on the ancient fragments and earlier works. Some examples, um, Aeschylus Myrmidons in the early 5th century BC and Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida in 1602 AD. The list of Achilles and Trojan War-inspired plays and poems and books is, and films is far too numerous to list here. And when I mention the canon, I am referring to the catalog of generally accepted myth facts surrounding Achilles and the Trojan War. In this podcast, I will be exploring many sources, hopefully broadening the view on Achilles.
Achilles and the Trojan War have been the subject of the popular Wolfgang Peterson's 2004 movie, Troy, and Madeline Miller's 2010 novel, Song of Achilles. And most recently, the BBC and Netflix collaboration for the 2018 series, Troy, Fall of a City. These three modern interpretations have not been without controversy and criticism, mainly due to the fact that audiences already have an image of Achilles that they expect. Miller's novel explores a teenaged Achilles and Patrocles as lovers, and I don't recall if she addressed the myth fact that they were cousins or not. It's been several years since I read the book, but I really enjoyed the story. And what I really liked was that she tackled the big question about the nature of Achilles and Patrocles' relationship. Peterson's Troy was visually stunning, but in the end, too short and missing the gods. The question about Achilles and Patrocles was answered somewhat by the fact that Patrocles was the younger cousin, and although I wasn't a fan of Orlando Bloom's portrayal of Paris, I really loved the battle scenes and the epic fight sequence between Achilles and Hector. The BBC's Troy, Fall of a City, was problematic from the get-go, primarily this one due to casting. And I think that controversy made a lot of people not give it the chance that it deserved. The costuming was fantastical and, in my humble opinion, absolutely amazing. It was the most ambitious version that we've had cinematically, at the very least a step in the right epic direction. We got a glimpse of Clytemnestra and Iphigenia and Penelope and Odysseus and the Amazon Queen Penthesilia. And we got the gods. Let me repeat that for the people in the back. The gods were right there interacting with the characters. And that was probably my personal favorite aspect of this version. The BBC tackled the Achilles and Patroclus question by turning this into a threesome on the beach with Briseis. All in all, these modern retellings bring new ideas and interpretations to the table. The beauty is that the canon is simply a guideline, so authors, movie makers, storytellers of all genres are free to interpret or reimagine the story. Taking us back to the earliest tradition of the Trojan War stories being fluid. Ultimately, as a storyteller myself, I needed to discover the layers of my Achilles. Fans of the Trojan War myth and retellings have a very clear view in their mind of who Achilles was and what he looked like. Whether it's from a movie or book that I've mentioned or from personal reading. And these connections are really strong. Fans can and will be vocal, sometimes angry, if a representation of Achilles doesn't fit the image they've mentally constructed for themselves. It's kind of like messing with Luke Skywalker or Jon Snow. They're iconic and practically untouchable. So where do all these ideas about Achilles come from? It turns out from many different sources over hundreds and thousands of years. Achilles is indeed immortal but his song has not been static. I discovered a great article by Celsiana Warwick, now Dr. Warwick, that was published in 2013 in the UC Davis Undergrad Research Journal. She wrote an essay for the post-Homeric representations of Achilles and Patrocles in classical literature. She begins with a discussion of what Homer presents, or doesn't present, about Achilles and Patrocles. Her main point is that each culture in its time presents an Achilles and Patrocles that suits whatever the culture is promoting or provoking at the time. By diving into Homer, we are hearing a roughly mid-7th century BC storyteller retelling a much older story, as the Trojan War itself was likely real and took place somewhere around 1250 BC about 500 years earlier than Homer. The twists and turns the oral Trojan War stories took over 500 years are something we can only guess at. The main takeaway from this regarding retellings or adaptations is that different cultures through different eras will emphasize or explore what they currently value and omit what they consider offensive or outdated. 
Dr. Casey Dewey Hackney talks about the multiple strands of Trojan War stories that probably floated around the Greek world and how over time the variety seen in performances became more regimented. Certain expectations arose and parts of the wider stories, the more fantastical elements, were eliminated. Even certain characters like Perseus were condensed to a few lines, even though she was a pivotal character. Without her, for example, we don't have the catalyst for the civil war between Achilles and Agamemnon. Even though it might take as many as three days and nights to perform, the Iliad is nevertheless a compression of the full potential extant of epic poetry about Troy. We might call the ultimate expansion of the Iliad. I have argued that one result of this compression is that the Iliad gives us only a glimpse of the figure of Briseis, whose role in the larger epic tradition must have been much greater at one time. That's the end quote from Dr. Dewey. She uses the word compressed to address how the variety of Trojan War stories ended up homerized or standardized. This homerization is what most of the modern retellings we know rely on. Let's consider Dr. Dewey's points about story compression in the ancient world and Dr. Warwick's points about how time and place impact what are emphasized. Story compression is very much like what happens when a book is adapted to a movie or series. Characters are omitted or compressed. Secondary storylines are sometimes omitted altogether because of time and budget constraints and perceived audience reception. Consider Game of Thrones, for example. Many fans of the Song of Ice and Fire books were disappointed that Lady Stoneheart was not included and that in the adaptation certain prophecies were inconclusive or ignored. Even today, the Song of Ice and Fire book community is waiting, still waiting, myself included, for the next book with hopes that George R. R. Martin will clear up what became cloudy or unsatisfactory in the HBO adaptation. Consider also the last three Star Wars films produced by Disney. Most of the Star Wars fandom was, and maybe still is, upset about how iconic characters like Luke and Han were treated, how established canon in the Star Wars universe was ignored. According to Entertainment Weekly, in their September 24, 2019 interview with George Lucas, the Star Wars Universe creator, he confirmed what fans had been feeling all this time and basically that he was upset how his story had been hashed up. Then we have The Lord of the Rings, directed by Peter Jackson, which, although based on the George R.R. R. Tolkien books, has itself become a kind of canon of Middle-earth. The Tolkien estate, in order to preserve the canon that Tolkien created about Middle-earth, currently watches the Amazon Prime production of its Middle-earth universe very closely. My point is this. Story compression is not a foreign concept in modern storytelling. Audiences, at any given time and for every retelling or performance, have expectations of beloved stories characters, and worlds. What is selected for compression, omission, or inclusion will impact how a particular production is received. Whether it's Hesiod or Homer, Aeschylus or Shakespeare, or Miller or Barker, audiences for the Trojan War and Greek mythology have expectations for characters and stories, and the focus of this podcast is the beloved character, Achilles. Dark hero or villain, Achilles is arguably one of the most recognizable figures of the Trojan War, even for those who aren't Greek myth buffs. Achilles' life began with a prophecy tied to his mother, Thetis, a sea nymph. The prophecy foretold that Thetis' son would become more powerful than his father. This was problematic because Zeus and Poseidon were both pursuing Thetis as a sexual partner. As we know, Zeus and Poseidon had children by multiple women, so a long-term monogamous relationship was not what they were after. Zeus was informed of the prophecy and deeply troubled because if Thetis were to have his son, that could spell big trouble for Olympus. Zeus had risen up against his own father, Kronos, and with the help of the other Olympians, defeated Kronos and all the other Titans. 
At the end of this War of the Titans, the Titans were imprisoned in Tartarus. Zeus wanted to avoid another war among the gods, so he decided that Thetis should never be married to an immortal or bear the child of an immortal. It was decided that she should marry King Peleus of Phthia and that her son would be gifted, but nonetheless a mortal. This was unhappy news for the sea nymph, that she would be forced to marry a mortal man and that her only child, a son, would be mortal. As an immortal herself, she would be faced with an eternity of mourning for a child who would only walk beside her for the length of time a man may walk the earth. To make it more heartbreaking for Thetis, a second prophecy was tied to Achilles' life. He was given a dual fate, one which he and his mother grappled with his entire life. In the Iliad, Book 9, lines 410 through 416, we read, quote, For my mother tells me, Thetis of the Silver Feet, that two fates carry me to death's end. If I remain here to fight around the city of the Trojans, my return home is lost, but my glory will be undying. But if I go home to the beloved land of my father, outstanding glory will be lost to me, but my life will be long nor will death's end come on me quickly. What does this mean for Achilles? He is meant either for war and immortal glory, or a long, ignoble life, taking his father's place on the throne of Phthia. This dilemma frames Achilles' dialogue in the 2004 movie Troy, when he tells the young boy, that's why no one will remember your name. It's also behind the next major events in Achilles' young life, Thetis knew about Achilles' dual fate from the beginning, and she also realized her son was destined for war, and it was her mother's determination to keep him from dying. What happens next in Achilles' life is the result of hundreds of years of narrative compression, as there are multiple stories regarding the hero's mortality that basically boil down to, and no pun intended, fire or water. Through Hesiod in the 8th century BC, who was a contemporary of Homer, we have the Agamemnius fragments. The second fragment reads, quote, The author of the Agamemnius says in the second book that Thetis used to throw the children she had with Peleus into a cauldron of water because she wished to learn where they were mortal. And after many had perished, Peleus was annoyed and prevented her from throwing Achilles into the cauldron. End quote. A cauldron is used to heat water, so it is possible Thetis was throwing children into, quote, hot water to see if they would survive, or was she performing some ritual to test or turn the children she had with Peleus into immortals? Remember, she knows full well why she's been married off against her wishes to a mortal man, and that from the beginning she knew she would survive any and all children she had with Peleus. Roughly 500 years later, Apollonius of Rhodes wrote that, quote, The infant Achilles, who is now with Chiron the centaur, and is fed by water nymphs, though he should be at your, Thetis's breast, Peleus had never set eyes on her, Thetis, since the night when, in a rage, she had left her bridal bed. They had quarreled about the illustrious Achilles. He was a baby then, and in the middle of the night she used to surround her mortal child with fire, and every day anoint his tender flesh with ambrosia to make him immortal and save him from the horrors of old age. One night, Peleus, leaping out of bed, saw his boy gasping in the flames and gave a terrible cry. It was a foolish thing to do. Thetis heard and, snatching up the child, threw him screaming to the floor, then passing quickly out of the house, light as a dream and insubstantial as air, she plunged into the sea. She was mortally offended, and she never returned. The earlier stories of Achilles being burned as a baby have now morphed with added details, supplying reasoning and consequences. Thetis burned Achilles to make him immortal and rubbed ambrosia on him in the day to lessen the pain or encourage the immortal aspect of his being to emerge. Apollonius also gave us the reason that Thetis left Achilles and Peleus. Her mortal husband didn't understand what she was doing. In this version, she threw Achilles on the floor and stormed off. But this reaction of hers gives me pause, because the Thetis we know from Homer, 500 years earlier, 
is a mother constantly seeking ways to support and glorify her son. She weeps with him and for him. She even goes to Zeus on his behalf after Agamemnon took Perseus. And she went to the god Hephaestus to request new armor for Achilles after Patrocles' death and Hector had confiscated the armor, or Achilles' original armor. The Iliad doesn't cover Achilles' death, but in later versions, Thetis collects her son's body when he dies. These are things a concerned, loving, if even overprotective mother does, not something an angry, unfeeling, unsympathetic mother does. Achilles being burned by fire isn't as well known as the story of him being dipped in the river Styx by Thetis, who dangled him by his heel. In the Achilleid, recorded by Stadius in the first century AD, we read, this is Thetis speaking, I take my son Achilles down to the void of Tartarus and dip him in the springs of Styx. The Carpathian seer bids me banish these terrors by the ordinance of magic rite and purify the lad in secret waters beyond the bound of heaven's vault, where is the farthest shore of Oceanus, and Father Pontus is warmed by the ingliding stars. There are awful sacrifices and gifts to the gods unknown, but tis long to recount all, and I am forbidden. Over hundreds of years, Achilles' origin story and life event stories emerge through a variety of sources. This is a perfect example of Dr. Douay's assertions regarding story compression in the ancient world. Although not strictly oral stories, these written stories, by several sources, serve to elaborate and flesh out the details of Achilles' life and deeds. What has survived to the modern world's narrative regarding Achilles' mortality is the more recent version of Achilles being dipped into water by his mother to prevent his early death. When researching about Achilles, I was surprised by the stories of his mother trying to burn the mortality from his body. It is certainly more painful and more brutal and more confusing by human standards to conceive of this, as humans by nature run from fire. Storytellers from Homer's time to now must find ways to either blend what is known or choose one option over another. So, what can we conclude about the compression of this early part of Achilles' story? Well, that his mother, Thetis, was desperate to make her mortal son immortal by any means necessary, fire or water. In Song of Sacrifice, the first book of the Homeric Chronicles, I wrote the scene like this. Sorry, little one, I must cover you completely, if I'm to save you at all. Thetis continued to massage the god's golden nectar into his skin. When she was satisfied with the ambrosia, she placed the hair of Zeus into the fire. Blue, then red flames licked around the silver basin until thin fingers of silver rose from the heat. Thetis pulled Achilles from her breast. He squalled, Hush, shh, 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 my golden boy, this will be quickly over. She held him over the dancing flames that reached for his feet and curled around his ankles. Achilles wailed loudly, squeezing his eyes shut against the searing pain. Tears filled Thetis's eyes as she waited for Achilles' mortality to burn away. "'What are you doing to my son?' roared Peleus behind her. A handful of royal guards followed him. "'I knew you were hiding something from me, but I never thought you'd stoop so low as this.' Startled, Thetis jerked a dangling Achilles from the fire. Words failed her. "'Answer me, you witch!' What treachery do you perform, roasting my son to death like an animal? Thetis stood, hugging Achilles to her naked breast. You don't understand, Peleus. I am... Peleus took three long strides toward his wife. I don't care why you wish to burn my son. He ripped the child from her embrace. Thetis stumbled backwards. I love Achilles. You know that's the truth. I do him no harm. Give me my son. Reeling from what he'd witnessed with his own eyes, he shook his head. He's my son. I curse the gods for giving me yet another wicked woman. And you, Thetis, you've broken my trust for good. Get out. Get out of my palace, nymph. Thetis watched in horror as the enchanting flames cooled to embers in the bowl. Her heart sank, knowing the ritual hadn't been completed. 
She'd never have another chance to gather strands of Zeus's hair. The duality of Achilles' fate, foretold by Themis, was now sealed. You have no idea what you've done, Peleus. You've set our son on the path of doom. Peleus was left to raise Achilles alone, but it didn't take too long before the young prince was sent to study and train with Chiron, the respected centaur healer. Chiron had been training heroes for generations, and now it was Achilles' turn. Under the centaur's tutelage, Achilles would learn the healing arts, music, and war. Chiron was a tamer of the untamed spirits. Achilles would have learned about all the heroes who came before him, what made them tick, what they thought, and it put him in a special category. The heroes trained by Chiron were a small elite group, including Peleus, Jason, and Heracles. When I consider all the accomplishments and terrors attributed to Achilles' life, it takes me back to this time that he spent with Chiron when he was a boy. I think Achilles would have been a charmer, a little wild, and likely very obstinate. The time Achilles spends with Chiron is, in my opinion, crucial to his development as a warrior and leader in the Trojan War to come. In chapter 37 of Song of Sacrifice, I explored the relationship between Achilles and his teacher. I wanted a scene that would give us the background on why Achilles was called swift-footed. Trails lined the foothills of Mount Pelion where Chiron trained Achilles. Run! Run as the wind, young master! The centaur shouted over his shoulder at the young man keeping pace behind him. Chiron burst into full gallop with Achilles hard on his heel. They ran full force until they reached the edge of the plain. The centaur pulled up the pace. Achilles grabbed his side and took a few deep breaths. I could have overtaken you, you know. Chiron noted the absence of sweat. Interesting. What? the prince asked. I believe you may be telling the truth. I never lie to you, Achilles straightened up. Well, mostly. That was an honest statement. Your lack of sweat tells me you did indeed hold back. Achilles grinned mischievously. He pointed across the level plain stretching out before them. Care to wager which of us can make it across there first? Chiron glanced across the lengthy course. Hmm, what is the wager? You carry me back to the cave. The centaur laughed. Hi, <laughs> you're heavy, young master. I'll agree if you make the wager even. Achilles sputtered a drink of water. Carry you back? You weigh like a rock. I suggest you win, then. Chiron pulled at the ground. Ready, young master? Achilles tossed his water pouch aside, taking position next to his mentor. Get ready to carry me all the way back. Chiron reared up and shouted, Catch me if you're able. The centaur pounded the ground with heavy hooves, sending showers of dirt and sand in Achilles' direction. They ran with the wind at their backs, Achilles matching stride with the great beast. Chiron glanced over his shoulder. Run, he shouted. Run! Achilles needed no more encouragement than that. He kicked his heels higher so that his feet barely touched down on the ground. He ran as if inspired by fleet-footed Hermes. The edge of the plain neared, and Achilles finally pulled away from Chiron, touching the edge of the plain in triumph. The centaur pulled up on his hooves to break his speed, needing to catch his breath before speaking. Your... The first. Never has a man who beat me in a race. Never. It's your training that gives me advantage, Achilles grinned. I'm glad I won, because it's a long way back home. Chiron heaved a heavy and tired sigh. Climb up, young master. We best begin. He held an arm out to pull Achilles up. Tell me about Heracles, Achilles said. Well, what would you like to know? Did you know him when he defended Hesione, that Trojan princess? Yes, yes I did. That's a good tale, young master. Would you like to hear it? Leave nothing out. Chiron's eyes twinkled. Hesione was a beautiful woman, perhaps the most beautiful woman to ever grace the city of Troy. <laughs> you should know, I suppose, Achilles said. Young master, I'm chaste. 
for a centaur. He laughed. I thought you asleep when... Chiron stopped. Were you awake every time? Every single time, Achilles confirmed with a lopsided smirk. Chiron looked at Achilles, narrowing his eyes. You're a roguish one. When Achilles' training with Chiron was complete, he returned to Phythia and his father, Peleus. It's at that point that Thetis reappears in her son's life. She is still concerned about her son's dual fate and that without immortality, he would likely die at war. According to Apollodorus, the prophecy that Troy could not be taken without Achilles spurred Thetis into action. She convinces Peleus to let their son be hidden in Skyros at the court of Lycomedes. The catch? He must dress as a woman and keep his whereabouts hidden from the world. It is here in Skyros that Achilles gets the princess Didamia pregnant with his only child, a son named Neoptolemus. After many years, when the call to Aulis had been made, Odysseus arrived on a mission for Agamemnon, locate and convince Achilles to come to Aulis and go to war. The king of Ithaca disguised himself as a beggar, a ruse he uses more than once, and he pushed a cart full of exquisite fabrics and baubles into the courtyard. The princesses admired all his wares, including Achilles dressed as a woman. But Achilles' hand touched the hilt of the sword that had been hidden among all the fabric and pulled it free of the linen. He swung it around, effectively blowing his cover. The rest is Trojan War history. Odysseus convinces him to go to Aulis and then on to Troy. It is worth noting here that Achilles was not present at Sparta when Helen was choosing a husband. He is one of the few princes who did not take the infamous oath of Tyndareus. Achilles was never a suitor of Helen. He sails to Aulis of his own free will, not because he's been compelled like Odysseus and all the others who took the oath. What transpired at Aulis should have resulted in a civil war right there and then, convincing everyone to sail back home. But it didn't. At Aulis, Agamemnon lured his daughter Iphigenia into becoming an unwitting sacrifice. He told her she needed to come to Aulis so she could be married off to Achilles before they set sail, all unbeknownst to Achilles. In my series, I begin the antagonism between Agamemnon and Achilles with this moment, this lie. After the sacrifice of Iphigenia, the winds rose and the fleet set sail. What transpires next is a nine-year gap filled by fragments and random stories until we get to the first book of the Iliad. Most movies about the Trojan War compress the nine years of siege warfare into a few battles. We don't really get the sense that the Greeks and Trojans and their allies have been fighting for almost a decade. The Greeks weren't idle for those forgotten years because we do have stories of them conquering Trojan allies from the surrounding islands and towns up and down the coast and inland. Achilles tells us in Book 9, line 27, that he has conquered 12 cities through naval battles and 11 on foot. That's 23 cities total, or three conquests a year. A pretty impressive feat when you consider logistics and supply in the Bronze Age. We also understand Achilles' growing resentment of Agamemnon, who was raking in the lion's share while he gave very little back to anyone. It's during those nine years that Achilles conquered Lyrnessus, where he captured Briseis, and we learned from her few lines in the Iliad that, during that conquest, she witnessed Achilles kill her brothers and her father. This is also when Achilles sacked Pedasus, Andromache's home, killing her family. In my quest to fill in the blanks for this nine-year gap, I came across Dr. Martine Kuyper's paper, The Sack of Methemna in Lesbukitis. This is a betrayal story casting Achilles in a very dark shadow. Achilles uses the Methemnon princess Pisidike to gain access to the city by promising to marry her. He lied. He raised the city to the ground and then he killed Pisidike, presumably for being a traitor to her people. And this speaks to whether or not you see Achilles as a hero or a villain. It literally depends on whose side you're on and how you judge acts of violence perpetrated in warfare. Is all fair in love and war? I believe that is the question. That's it for part one of the first episode of Superman of Greek Mythology on the Greek Mythology Retold podcast. 
Hope you've enjoyed this episode and hit me up on any of my socials. You can find me on Twitter at G Retold and Facebook at Greek Mythology Retold. If you'd like to look into my work as an author on Greek mythology, you can find me at Twitter, The Raven Angel, Facebook at Janelle Rhiannon, YouTube at Janelle Rhiannon, and my Insta is Janelle Rhiannon Author. If you enjoy listening, then subscribe and like my show on the platform of your choice. What's my exciting news, you ask? I now have a members-only podcast subscription available where I give you exclusive access to all my research notes and discussions of the essays and books I read, exclusive peeks into my writing world, and full access to the special effects versions of the Homeric Chronicle pod books. All this is ad-free. Join me there for a sneak peek at Drunk Achilles and an in-depth analysis of Dr. Dewey Hatton's paper, Mother in Arms, Soldiers' Emotional Bond, and Homeric Similes, which heavily influenced my construction of Achilles' character. Subscribe and become a Myrmidon Elite today. The link will be in the bio. Well, what are your thoughts on Achilles so far, and how do you see him? And if you're curious, please continue with part two. That's it for today, so drink your wine and be merry, Myrmidons. <laughs>